So our next speaker is uh, James Engel. He's professor of English and comparative literature at uh, Harvard University. He revived the teaching of rhetoric at Harvard in 2001 as part of the program in general education. His, his many books include The Creative Imagination, Enlightenment to Romanticism, The Committed Word, Literature and Public Values, and Saving Higher Education in the Age of Money. Uh, he's produced a variety of scholarly editions, uh, and he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was a senior fellow at the National Humanities Center, and the courses he teaches include rhetoric, environmental literature, British Romanticism, the Enlightenment, literary theory, and the history of criticism. So please welcome uh, Professor Engel, and, and thanks again for serving on such short notice as well. Thank you, good evening. I want to give special thanks to Michelle Saltzman, Alan, Helen Collier, and also Kathleen Coleman. The title of my talk is Democracy is Deliberation. Rhetoric is indispensable, use or be used. These remarks, while not news to many, may serve some good if they fulfill that duty that Samuel Johnson indicates every writer and teacher should take up, to renovate known truths that have often been suffered to lie in neglect. The first two talks in this panel have been superb. In his lectures on rhetoric and oratory in 1810, John Quincy Adams urges students to learn rhetoric as a civic responsibility required in a democracy where the beating heart of government is deliberation. Laws are made, interpreted, and maintained through deliberation. The executive enforces legislation deliberatively and forensically. Courts weigh evidence to judge guilt and innocence. In a nation blessed with free speech, and freedom of worship, the arts of language, persuasion, ministry, and ceremony are thrown open to every citizen who does not incite violence or yell fire in a crowded theater where there is none. Free speech involves what the late Anthony Lewis identified in the title of his magnificent book, Freedom for the Thought that we hate, a biography of the First Amendment, intentionally using hate to oppose the idea that some speech is so hateful that we label it as hate speech and then outlaw it. Democracy is trial by jury, a free press, social media, tweets, TV, the street corner orator, and the invited college speaker. It's messy. It deals with complex issues, unintended consequences, multiple constituencies, and always competing voices. In this practice of democracy, rhetoric is inescapable. Otherwise, we would be reduced to the silly philosophers of Swift's Gulliver's Travels, who eschew words and rhetoric and communicate only by handing one another objects that they carry around in big backpacks. Yet the word rhetoric is now a byword for false reasoning and cynical persuasion. The common objection that what any opponent may claim is mere rhetoric only confirms that in democracy, rhetoric responsible and irresponsible, is universally present. Getting rid of it would be like getting rid of the soil in a garden, on the ground that unlike the fruits and vegetables it produces, it's too dirty and can't be eaten. Of course, some soil is better than others. Add to this that in a democracy, 
there remains the anthropological need for leadership, for a person or a small group of people to speak for the country as a whole. The nation state can magnify rather than diminish this need, born first of the clan or the tribe. A leader cannot meet that responsibility unless there is attentiveness to the nation's divisions and animosities. Rhetoric can heighten those. It can also heal them, elevate common aspirations, and elicit compromise. Beginning with the new rhetoricians of the late 18th century, Adam Smith, Joseph Priestley, George Campbell, Hugh Blair, and others, soon to include John Quincy Adams, the best leaders of democracy have mobilized the English language for greater good. The new rhetoricians studied Pericles, Plato, Demosthenes, Quintilian, Cicero, and Aristotle, and they studied them thoroughly. Abraham Lincoln spent most of his 20s and 30s poring over books of rhetoric, grammar, logic, and poetry more than law. Lord Curzon, when asked who the greatest stylist in affairs of English government was, declined to name anyone in Great Britain and instead said it was Lincoln. Frederick Douglass, while still enslaved, purchased his copy of the Columbian orator for 50 cents, a fortune to him, and began his study of rhetoric, emerging with Lincoln among the most rhetorically and morally gifted American spirits of the 19th century. Churchill, who as you probably know, was a very poor student of the classics, nevertheless knew how to shape English sentences so that each became a spitfire. Susan B. Anthony's testimony before a Senate committee in 1888 reveals brilliant strokes of rhetoric and truth that would not come into reality until well into the next century. Martin Luther King Jr., Barbara Jordan, Ronald Reagan, everyone an excellent communicator. Today, we recall what Daniel Webster said during the compromises leading to the Civil War. You can no more keep out of politics than out of the frost. Especially true today. Emerson recorded that, noting it twice, years apart, adding the second time his own verdict, it is impossible to extricate oneself from the questions in which our age is involved. Reflecting on the recently passed Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, he said something that we may now think ourselves, regardless of personal views, the last year has forced us all into politics. What are we to do today? Those of us who know rhetoric in its classical and more recent forms. Let us teach it not only as one aspect of the ancient world or as a set of terms, but as an act of skill, as an art, and a form of systematic knowledge, one that can be imbued with ethical responsibility. It's interesting that almost every professor of rhetoric in the United States in the 19th century was not called a professor of rhetoric. That person's title was almost always Professor of Rhetoric and Moral Philosophy. There's a real reason for that. Using the classics to apply them imaginatively to the here and now. This is how Burke applied his knowledge of the classics in practical contexts. Teaching rhetoric is a civic education. Exposure to it in the schools before college is a service to democracy. Every student, regardless of specialization or interest, benefits from knowing and practicing rhetoric, as we've already heard this afternoon, not simply to articulate opinions already held, but to examine the views of others, considering and even adopting 
some of them. The art of the rebuttal grasps the best argument against one's self. If it's done openly, it will broaden thinking and change it. This then is the argument. Let us teach rhetoric as an exercise of citizenship. Let us insist that it become part of every student's education. Coupled with general knowledge, the nonpartisan study of rhetoric is an antidote to the slick call of the snake oil salesman and a bulwark against a society that is awash with information but fixated on a low level of it. Now, why are citizens sometimes taken in by promises, by alternate facts, or by enthymemes of invalid syllogisms which emanate from every color of the political spectrum? In large measure because they are frustrated angry, and need genuine hope. Democracy has not served them as well as they had expected, certainly not as well as it had served a small group who prosper at the top. That small and very prosperous group has learned to capture the political system and direct its language not for civic virtue, but for self-interest not rightly understood. The boarded main street of Shikshini, Pennsylvania, the rural struggles of Wapwalapan, of Nanakoke, the closed mines of Hazelton, the pressures on Dubois, these are in my family and memory on both sides. For decades, both parties failed to address the needs of the great middle. Both parties courted high rollers and large checks and both remain beholden to them. The most common street sign in the Great Recession, a recession that still infects many parts of the country, ironically echoes the first cause of that recession, namely the most common sign in American politics and lobbying, for sale. It has now produced a transactional government, no surprise. It was only a matter of time until one candidate, and it did not matter from which party, capitalized on the situation and turned it back to the people as the false prophecy that only a person who had practiced such dealing could save the people from it and restore the nation. Democracy is subject to abuses. It's slow to react, it's liable to the paralysis of faction, it's tempted by proclamations of the telegenic. At times it is enthralled to the lowest common denominator of judgment and vulnerable to rumors swirling in social media, maliciously planted even by foreign powers. In short, democracy is a system of government superior to all the others because their faults are not proclivities to error, but error institutionalized itself. The cure for the ills of democracy is, as Al Smith said, more democracy. Such a prescription would be malpractice to apply to any other system. Placing sovereign power in the people is potentially dangerous, but placing it anywhere else is fatal. Love of power is so ensconced in the heart that only by putting a check on power into the hands of the widest possible suffrage are the worst corruptions avoided. The self-corrective power of democracy, though at times sluggish, works exceedingly well. It has worked best through the rhetorical gift of honest leaders who understand the opposition they face, make considered policy decisions, and sincerely persuade others of the common advantage that those decisions might afford. Such leaders and the citizens who elect them have always realized, I think, even if they did not use that word, that rhetoric is unavoidable and that ethical education in the use of it 
is necessary for democratic leader and for sovereign citizen alike. Thank you.